You're listening to DK Mag Sessions The Pinch For 20 years I've been running around the valley for that smug bastard doing all these stupid little errands he sends me on. He owes me this promotion. I deserve it. And he knows it. And he better give it to me or I'm finished. Thank you for tuning in. This is Ken Artus, your host. And I am also the founder for DK Mag. And this is DK Mag Sessions, the podcast in which we focus on one film, four different topics on that film, and also feature an exclusive interview with either the director, writer, or cast members of said film. And for this episode, we're going to be focusing on the action crime thriller, The Pinch. And we have an exclusive interview with the director writer, Ashley Scott Myers, and also the lead in this film, Gunner Wright. And joining me as co host is Stacy Cox, staff correspondent for DKMag.com. Be sure to stop by our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash DKMag. Your donations will help us bring future episodes. As a patron, you'll receive bonus content as well as free and discounted on upcoming DK Mag merchandise. And as I had mentioned, we have two exclusive interviews. And also, our next DK Mag sessions is a continuation interview with actor Gunnar Wright in which we celebrate the 10-year anniversary of Dead Space, to which Gunnar Wright provided the voiceovers for Isaac Clarke in all two installments. I was going to say three, but for those who played the game, Isaac Clarke does not speak in the first game. But Gunnar Wright was in all three games. In any event, Stacy, uh, we've seen the film... And this is a different take from the usual horror films that we do. This is a, well, it classified as a thriller and we do thrillers. So that's interesting right there. Yeah, I actually, I enjoyed the uh, story and the film itself, um, how it played out. At first I was getting aggravated with it, but then as it progressed on, I started uh, kind of smiling and laughing. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's just jump right into it and we could give our opinions on the film and kicking it off with our first section, our first segment, uh, the first impressions for The Pinch. The Pinch First Impressions Our first segment is the first impressions of the film The Pinch. And for those who haven't seen it, here's the synopsis. The Pinch is a crime thriller when a low-level mobster is nearly rubbed out by the boss. He decides to take the bonus he was promised by force. So he kidnaps the boss and demands a hefty ransom. Good fellas meets misery. Stacy, let's kick it off with, let's say, the plot here. Uh, what were your initial thoughts on the plot surrounding this film? I enjoy the plot. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, at first I was, I was getting a little angry with um, how it was progressing, but then. I started to smile because that comedy aspect of it. Yes, I I did enjoy the pinch myself. It is a low key type uh, crime drama. It didn't have all the car chases and the shootouts. Well, I think there was a couple of shootouts, but nothing so elaborate. And I did appreciate that. That aspect of the film. It was all close-knit, low-budget, low-key, nothing over the top. 
And the the director and the writer, Ashley Scott Myers, he did a good job of just keeping it that way. Sometimes you don't want all those car chases. You just want a story. And that's what the pinch has. It has a good story. Yes. And I also felt like I was watching a spoof of a, you know, like like minded film. It did. It kind of felt like a spoof to me. <laughs> but I, I didn't actually see a spoof. Uh, I think it's it was it was original in its own little way because while i was watching the film i couldn't place my finger on what type of film this would resemble or borrow from and so i said okay this is cool i like it uh, it is it, good for what it is a low-key film not saying it's in a bad way but it's sometimes like no. i said sometimes you don't want the the excitement and the explosions well, no, not a bad film at all. I guess I was talking more so in um, the cast performances. Uh, like, Gunner Wright. Gunner, no. Yeah, Gunner Wright. Um, I'm laughing at his character as he's just hesitating to, you know, take things to the next level. Right. Well, let's so, just jump on uh, performances. I think... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think he that type of character. He was such a low key character, a a, a guy who doesn't doesn't want to do what he's doing, but he has to do it because if not, then something bad is going to happen to him. Yes, um, he like he definitely. Uh, or should I say his character struggled to adapt to the situation? Like, uh, you know, the saying goes, everyone wants to be, what is it? Everyone wants to be uh, the lion until it's time to start making lion moves or something like that. Well, I felt like he was in that position right there um, where, you know, he kidnaps his boss and he's like, okay, you're going to, you're going to give me this money, whether you like it or not. But at the same time, he's hesitating because um, he really doesn't want to take it that far so he's kind of hoping he's hoping that Kane uh, will just comply right and the thing that's funny there is that the the antagonist and the protagonist were good friends so I think that's another complexity in the story he did the lead Rob he didn't want to do what he wanted to do to the other guy because he said hell I've known you for so many years why why are you acting such an asshole why are you being such a jerk just give me my money that's all I want but the you know the antagonist Kane he was like no I, I ain't giving you shit <laughs> yeah, well, plus there's, stubborn. there's that whole back and forth between you know I deserve it and yeah you kind of deserve it but you kind of don't because you're a you know Part of my friends, you're a bitch, and you don't take what you want. It's that whole right. like, what? <laughs> what is going <laughs> on here? <laughs> oh, that 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 was funny, and it did have some comedic elements to it. I did enjoy the cinematography of it as well. And once again, uh, for an indie film, this is one of those films that you could say, "Oh, hey, everything was well put together," even the performances, but. The comedy relief with those two hitmen, they, they felt kinda off. That was if I were to take oh, yeah. give a takeaway, they it was it was them. They it just felt their jokes were Do you know what movie I had in mind with those two? Uh that was Scotty and Darren. Uh do you know what movie I had in mind with those two? Um was it I'm trying to think what it was a cross between like Malibu's most wanted and bringing down the house. Okay. Remember the, and I don't know if you've ever seen Bringing Down the House. Have you seen that? N I don't remember. No. Okay. Well, uh, so Bringing Down the House stars Queen Latifah and um, Queen Latifah and Steve Martin. Okay. And uh, like Steve Martin kind of travels to this uh, the hood pretty much the hood okay and <laughs> i'm just laughing as he's trying to like fit in he changes his whole like demeanor and everything trying to fit in and then with malibu's most wanted you have tay diggs and anthony anderson who are 
I believe they went to Harvard. They're, they're like, they're um, professional college students, but they're trying to act hood in this whole like setup type of thing. Mm. <laughs> and just seeing uh, Terrell Dixon and Philip Musumeki, uh, it reminded me of those characters. You have to see the movies to like really understand what I'm saying. Uh, here. I'm trying to like describe. <laughs> I think I, I think it sounds familiar, but you know what these two guys reminded me of? Greg Robinson and Adam Scott from the TV series Ghosted. That's what they reminded uh, yeah. me. Of. That's what they reminded <laughs> yeah, me of. That's another one. <laughs> well, that's why I said like I felt like I was watching a spoof as well because I'm up here like, wait a minute, is this serious or is this like making fun of? like movies you know just the way the story was progressing and uh, uh, you know the performances and everything I'm like okay I feel like this is a school this is like more comedy uh, than anything but it was good it was it was a good time it was yeah a good time. yes it, it was it was good it, was, it for me I I would have liked to see more action more yeah, I don't know some hand to hand combat or something like that no 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 not necessarily gun shooting but some hand to hand combat here to make the movie feel more actiony the only thing that I would say is that interaction with the protagonist and the antagonist them talking back and forth give me the money no yes no it seemed to drag a bit I would have liked to see them fight and the bad guy would run away or the good guy would see himself tied up and getting kidnapped and then he flips the tables you know those type of films that the good guy flips the tables and now everything's in his favor that, that would have changed the pitch but overall I enjoyed the film yeah well see that's that whole hesitation that uh, Rob had with himself you yeah know, it's like um, I know I need to do this because that by don't I'm really in big trouble like he didn't already got himself into deep waters when he decided to you know kidnap his boss and hold him for ransom so he already got himself into deep waters there right and now it's, it's, it's that whole like dilemma on uh, uh, do I just let it all go or do I finish the job you know because right. if I let it all go he's gonna come back for me <laughs> right, right. Uh, he had to tie you know, up all the loose ends. That's true. Exactly. And he just kept hesitating with himself like that uh, one little brief. He was like, oh, I'm going to torture you for five minutes. <laughs> He's just like, what? And then he goes, not even a whole minute goes by. Man, maybe five minutes is a little too long. Yeah. <laughs> I think I made a point. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that serious? was hilarious. No. That was hilarious. Yeah, it's like, no, are you serious? You didn't make any point at all. <laughs> Come on, man! Give me some more. You gotta, you can wait. Like, wait a minute! You're working for this now, Kane. What was it? Was he a crime boss or something like that? Yeah, right? a low, yeah. So, a low level crime boss. So don't tell me you've been working for this crime boss all this time, and you can't even do what you're getting paid to do to him. Are you serious? <laughs> What kind of hitman are you? <laughs> uh, it was uh, that just that whole scenario was comical. The pinch protagonist impression. Uh, segment one, we talked a little bit about the characters, the performances of the actors in said characters. Now in this segment, we're going to showcase the highlights of the main character, the protagonist. Uh, there were so many aspects I enjoyed from Rob. I, I did enjoy that he was a down-to-earth guy that finds himself in a, in a bad predicament. Now, in this scenario, we, usually we see a tough guy with big muscles and a lot of guns with unlimited ammo. You know, like Chuck Norris. No, no, that's necessarily Chuck Norris. He's a regular guy. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these other martial arts films where you don't even care if the guy, you know, he's going to survive. So you don't really care if he gets shot. He's going to save the day. But in this scenario, 
the character down to earth you don't know what's gonna happen to him in some cases he doesn't know how to de defend himself and there was one scene that he was fighting with pain but he did have the smarts and that's what saved him at the end i have to agree with all of that and um i really enjoyed that whole just how he just had that whole dilemma from right from wrong right and wrong uh so he was both kind of like the protagonist and part antagonist as well um but in the end he was doing it all like for good because you know he deserved this and he knows he's a good guy he's just you know pretty much like an average joe who's trying to get by trying to do for his family and uh he's earned this you know he's a faithful employee respectable employee you know he earned he earns this and to be like played the way he did he took matters into his own hands right and that could play out to any scenario it doesn't have to be a crime boss or a messenger type guy because he was more he was mostly a messenger i think he wasn't the hitman he was just the middleman dropping off money here and there or whatever the case may be but this also applies to the real life scenarios sometimes you fed up and you're at work nine to five and sometimes you gotta tell your boss yo what's up i want my vacation time and that could really parallel this movie and this character because he's just a regular guy i like this guy i want to see him survive at the end we're not gonna give away the ending of course but like i said he used his smart to survive and sometimes that's more than big muscular biceps kicking people through windows and actually working for kane um it added up in his favor you know he knows the job you know he he ultimately like knows what he has to do um, but given their personal relationship, not just professional relationship, but their personal relationship as well, he uh, wants to do things like the right way at the same time. But, um, you know, if Kane isn't willing to negotiate or compromise, then he's he's not afraid to take it to the next level, to take it to where he has to take it to. Right. And you made a great point, uh, Stacy, that he, th this character, Rob, he has compassion. He was torturing his captive and he couldn't go through with it. He even put bandages on the uh, on the guy's wound. <laughs> that shows compassion. That is a that yeah. is a rarity when you see a main character trying to survive whatever the circumstance is usually you see someone tough hearted don't don't give a crap about the other guy i like that i like how this character was structured and I like how this character was portrayed and also he does have that comedy moment especially with the pizza where he switched the pizzas with the guy oh, i'm like yeah. uh come down i didn't even know the difference I only eat higher pizza. <laughs> Meanwhile, a bite into the cheaper pizza or supposedly low end, you don't even you can't tell Adam for me. Yes. Oh god. That was I was like, no. Really, dude? Really? Oh man. <laughs> Honestly, was... I would be like, be happy I'm feeding you anything. I could exactly. You could be locked up in the basement, some dungeon type basement with rats and roaches and chained up somewhere. And right. Just starving and dehydrating. <laughs> I have some hospitality here, so be thankful. <laughs> right. And and that's why when I read the synopsis it says Goodfellas meets misery, I said to myself, wait a second, this guy does not act nowhere near Kathy Bates' character. Her character, she was cold hearted. That's a that is a totally different contrast what we get with this character Rob. Um as you said, Kathy Bates and Misery was definitely cold hearted. I mean she tortured him more. Um I mean he had a bed, but <laughs> you know, she still tortured him. Um Rob here like 
he <laughs> he somewhat tortures Kay, but he can't really at the same time. It's like, okay, I'm going to just prove a little bitty point. I'm going to make a little hole in your foot. How's that? <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Tell me I can't do it, <laughs> you know, and um, that part actually tickled me. <laughs> it tickled me because he set a cyber for five minutes and I'm like not even a whole minute goes by he's like okay this is too much I can't do this like what am I doing what what have I become <laughs> right exactly he he did not want to be villainless he wanted to keep being the guy that he was and well I'm glad it worked out well for him that he didn't change his character and that's weird because usually well not usually all the time in film the character has to have a change from the beginning of the film to the end i didn't see much of a change in him he he still remained the same guy he didn't change what his demeanor he wasn't cold-hearted or anything oh yeah and actually i kind of felt like he was um his whole like demeanor posture everything was just just there just but like even his face expressions didn't really change they just remained the same through the whole movie uh so it was like hard to picture like okay is he i mean is he scared is he in shock you can't tell <laughs> what he's feeling because he just has this blank stare the whole way through and he really is like unmoving in that aspect like you know Kane is up here threatening oh you'll never get away with it and, you know I'm gonna kill you or you're gonna be dead before you get the money and stuff like that and he's just up here like okay <laughs> <laughs> you know he's just like he, he doesn't really have any emotion <laughs> right right I know what you mean yeah you're right he didn't have any emotion when he was getting threatened and everything and when you think that things are gonna not gonna go his way, especially in the beginning of the film when he was arrested, it's like okay, yeah, uh, okay, uh, and then like, oh, yeah, I, I did get that vibe, right, right, right. The police show up and he's just like, huh, oh well, I better go hide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then when you know Kane gets loose and he's coming after him, he's just sitting there like. Well, I guess this is how it ends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. No change of emotions at all. <laughs> well, that's 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 good though. It keeps you thinking, but at the other time, you you don't know how how this guy is feeling uh, inside. He he needs to shift his his facial characteristics and makes it more convincing to the audience if he's angry or sad or what have you. But when you also think about that, it, it makes like whatever he's going to do even that much more shocking and surprising. Right. Yeah. He, he kind of has you feeling like, well, is this it? Is he going to give in or what is going to you kind of like, you know, questioning what his next move is. Right. So when he makes his next move, it's like, oh, I didn't see that coming at all. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey, there's a flip side to it. Right. Right. Yeah. But. Overall, I did enjoy this guy. I, I, I like the uh, the underdog. That's the word I was looking for throughout this whole conversation. The underdog. And that is what he is. The regular average guy, underdog. Things are stacked against him. Will he pull through? Would he win? You don't know. You have to watch the film. <laughs> <laughs> The Pinch. Exclusive interview director, writer, Ashley Scott Myers. Our first of two exclusive interviews in this podcast is a conversational interview with Ashley Scott Myers. Ashley Scott Myers, according to INDB, is a writer, producer, and director. For The Pinch in particular, this is film is the feature debut for Ashley Scott Myers and in this interview we cover the various aspects of his debut as a director as well as his established career as a screenwriter the pros and cons of screenwriting and of course the entrepreneurial and creative aspects of 
being involved in film production and the performing arts. Without further ado, here is my interview with Ashley Scott Myers, writer director for The Pinch. Great. And to kick off the interview, please uh, provide an origin story, a little bit about yourself and how you got your start in the production, film production field. Sure. So um, my name is, is Ashley Scott Myers. I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland. I think I'm like a lot of people. I just love movies as a kid and always wanted to, you know, be involved in the movie business. Um, growing up on the East Coast in a town like Annapolis, there wasn't really a lot of artists of any sort, much less filmmakers. So, you know, it always felt kind of like a pie in the sky. It never felt like something that could actually really happen. Um, so I just kind of always had these, harbored these dreams of doing it, but never quite knew what to do. And then one time in college, I just coincidentally, I found this book called Writer's Market. And um, it had a whole bunch of production companies listed that would supposedly take um, submissions from new writers, unsolicited submissions from new writers. So that was kind of enough motivation for me to actually start to write some stuff and just kind of got the ball rolling. So I started to write scripts at that point. I graduated with college um, with an accounting degree. Didn't want to do any accounting at that point. So me and a buddy, we just moved out to Los Angeles and, um, you know, we didn't know anybody here. We just packed up all our stuff in a beat up pickup truck, drove across the country and, um, you know, started making our lives here. And this was in the mid nineties and just continued to write, continued to try and network and meet people. And eventually I was able to option and sell my first script called Dish Dogs. And I did it through just an ad in a trade magazine. Back then, this was in the late 90s. It was Hollywood Reporter, Daily Variety, sort of before the um, internet boom. And um, they still had print publications that I would look at. And sometimes production companies would just list in the back of them, hey, we're a production company. We have some, we're looking for this type of a script. And I started submitting to those. And that was my first option sale. And again, it was a movie called Dish Dogs. And that kind of got things started for me. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, I thought going into it that that would kind of launch my career. And, you know, it really didn't. It, it, the movie got made, and um, I didn't think the movie was particularly good, so maybe that was one problem. But, um, but it didn't really lead anywhere. So I kind of felt like, you know, I had to do some retooling and um, kind of come up with a, a scalable strategy to continue to write scripts and sell scripts. And I just learned more and more about marketing and how to get scripts to producers. I talked to more and more producers, got to know them, kind of tried to figure out what type of movies they thought um, could actually sell in the marketplace. And slowly, I'd say my writing became maybe a little more commercial um, mm -hmm. instead of sort of the art house drama. I was writing more sort of low budget genre pictures, horrors, thrillers, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, so since, since, you know, the early 2000s, I've been able to sell a bunch of scripts and had a number of writing assignments that um, got produced as well. And um, that's kind of my career. And, and maybe about three years ago, I got um, three. And so I'm, so I'm kind of, you know, working as a writer within these sort of independent genre films. And about three years ago, I got back-to-back -back writing assignments. And, um, you know, as a screenwriter, this is like fantastic. I mean, they weren't well-paid writing assignments, but, mm -hmm. you know, they were writing assignments nonetheless. And um, I just went through that process over the course of about three, four months, both of these writing assignments. And, um, it just, it wasn't a very creatively fulfilling process. And I just, I, you have to work as a screenwriter. You have to work so hard to get those jobs mm -hmm. that, and then when you get them, they're kind of disappointing. So that was really a point I just kind of decided to myself, I'm just going to start trying to make my own stuff. At least, you know, if it turns out terrible, at least it's terrible because of me, as opposed to, you know, any number of other factors, at least I can kind of control some of the, um, some of the input. So that led me to my recent film, The Pinch, which is a crime thriller. And um, I produced that one, you know, maybe a year ago, and we're just wrapping up post-production a couple months ago, and now we're um, getting ready to have our release for that film. Uh, congratulations on the on the release, and also for really think, taking the bulls by the horns and saying, hey, uh, I want to do my own thing. And as you had mentioned, if it comes out rad, bad, it's on you, not on someone else. Exactly, uh, yeah. I, it, I can't that, blame anybody but myself. <laughs> yeah, and, and I find that that's one area, especially as filmmakers who are first starting in their career, jumping into their productions, they feel that they have that fear of critique and they have not yet developed a tough skin if they release something that the public or certain audiences don't like. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, listen, even the greatest movies of all time, you can find detractors. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can find, especially in this day and age, even when, you know, really good films come out, you'll find some people online reviewing that will pick them apart and criticize them. Um, but just on the screenwriting level, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's a brutal business. I mean, you get into some of these meetings, these development meetings on your script. And I mean, these professional, you know, producers, directors, actors, I mean, they will just rip the thing to shred. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> developing a tough skin is definitely part of the process. So honestly, when I go on and, and I, I mean, if you're ever up for a laugh, just go on something like Netflix and look at some of the reviews. I did a movie called Ninja Apocalypse. And I mean, mm-hmm. the reviews are, are it's, it's comical to read them because the reviews are so bad. <laughs> um, so, but you know, something like that, as I said, right. I've just been through the meat grinder so many times. Like it's just not even, I mean, it just doesn't even phase me even a little bit um, compared to what, you know, the directors and producers and actors and development executives are going to do to your material. Right. And, as a matter of fact, I, I like it when things come full circle because not so long ago we had a director, Hank Braxton, and also Ricky Flowers for Snake Out of Compton, a uh, film which you wrote as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that was one of the writing assignments that I just mentioned, the back-to-back writing assignments. And that's a, that's a real good example of um, – it's a real good example of, of sort of the process. And so just – Specifically to that one, that was a script those producers hired me to write. Mm. And um, once they got the director on, I haven't actually seen a cut of the movie, so I don't know if there's anything of mine in there. But but the producers pretty much told me that they did a page one rewrite. And that's sort of the thing. It's like I labored over this script, you know, for a few months. And ultimately, none of it or very little of it actually made it to the screen. Um, And it just, you know, it just feels like kind of a waste. Again, they paid me. They were perfectly nice. There was nothing... um, you know, they have nothing sort of bad to say, and that's just the business. Like, truthfully, right. that's the business. And it's like if you're not prepared for that, you're probably not a good fit to be a professional screenwriter because that's just what happens. Um, and so for myself, I'm kind of exploring and trying to decide. Maybe I'm not, you know, cut out to be a professional screenwriter. Maybe I want to gear myself more towards the directing and producing just so I can maintain some of that control. I do understand the the obstacles of getting your script ripped to shreds. Uh, I've had that uh, years ago. And it's not even in not even in, in the indie field. It's just first starting out and you have uh, some individuals that say, oh, well, where's your IMDB credits? You don't have none, so we're, uh, we're not going to take a look at it. Or someone looks at your script and it just, as you mentioned, tear it to shreds and make something completely different that you have in mind. So I could understand just taking the bull by the horns and say, I'm going to do this myself. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's, so that's kind of where I am. And, and um, as I said, I just, I'm finishing up with the pinch now and I'm trying to get my next film going as well, you know, just using the pinch as a springboard um, mm-hmm. and, you know, whatever, some of the cast, some of the crew, some of the people I've met, you know, just keep things moving. And, and I'm in the process now of finishing a script and starting to raise the money. And I'm hoping to shoot something this year as well. But um, yeah, that's definitely sort of the trajectory that I'm I'm trying to stay on. Great. And that, that also leads to uh, starting selling your script.com and podcasts revolving around scripts. Yeah, so sure. So I'll take a step back there. So um, in the, in this mid to late nineties, as I said, when I started to actually sell Optum, sell a few scripts, Mm-hmm. Um, that was sort of the internet boom. And I actually set up a website for myself, just ashenmyers.com. And it was just kind of a, a website that just listed my log lines. But I learned enough HTML to kind of, you know, be kind of a low level web developer type of a thing. And so mm-hmm. at the, at the end of the nineties, early two thousands, I actually got a job and I worked for a number of years in web development and progressively got more and more, um, you know, advanced in that. And that's kind of, you know, what, what I kind of look at as selling your screenplay.com is it's kind of the, um, it's also a podcast. It's a podcast. And also I have a number of, of paid services to help screenwriters sell their stuff. And it's literally selling your screenplay.com. Um, but I kind of feel like it's a good sort of marrying of my skills. As I said, I've worked as a professional web developer for a number of years and um, also as a, as a screenwriter, professional screenwriter. So that's kind of, you know, taking my skill set and my talents, my interests, and kind of marrying them together. And um, and it's something that I've really enjoyed doing. I mean, the podcast has been great, um, and I'm sure you can relate to this. Um, you know, I get to interview lots of cool filmmakers. Um, 
so it's it's um it's interesting you know just doing it is is fascinating and fun and um and i just learn so much you know every week when i talk to these filmmakers i'm still learning a lot from them as well oh yes definitely and that's why i like to start off every interview with an origin story because it, for audiences they like to sit in the in the in their sofa or in the cinemas and just watch the film but there's so much layers that goes into creating a film from the writing process to the production process and even the performers themselves have something to offer that definitely resonates with someone's everyday life yeah for sure for sure i mean um it is, you know, even the worst movie out there, there's, you know, there's a backstory to that. And, and um, you know, someone didn't set out to make a bad movie. You know, they, everyone starts out trying to make a good movie and things go wrong and, and stuff. So, yeah, every movie, you know, I just respect any filmmaker that gets their film done, no matter how good or how bad. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> because, you know, that's all we can do. We just got to get out there and, and do our best. What were some of the obstacles or some of the lessons learned in creating this film? And yeah, so um, some of the obstacles. I mean, I think the biggest obstacle is always raising the money. Um, I did a Kickstarter and I raised about a third of the money through Kickstarter, um, and that was about a little over ten thousand, so maybe twelve thousand. My total budget, and I don't mind. I know a lot of filmmakers don't like talking about this. I don't mind being really transparent. The the feature it's a feature film, it's called The Pinch, um, mm -hmm. and thirty two thousand dollars was about the total budget. And as I said, about twelve of it was from Kickstarter, so about twenty of it was, was cash. Um, a lot of that was mine, probably ten or twelve of it was mine. I had another friend kick in some nice another two friends friends kicked in the other two. So that was a hurdle, you know, and there was a lot of false starts through that process. I always knew that if I, like, I was out there trying to raise more money. Like, I was trying to raise more like 100000 150000 and it just went on. I wasn't able to do it, so I kind of just had to retool and say, okay, you know, what can I do for $30,000? And, um, and that's basically what I do. So the raise, raising the money is definitely a problem. I, you know, with the Kickstarter, I don't know that I have any, you know, magic bullet suggestions for anybody, but it's all the typical stuff you hear. I mean, I had built a following through selling your screenplay, um, mm -hmm. through my podcast, through my blog over there. I had built at least a, a somewhat, you know, loyal following. And so a lot of those people did support the Kickstarter campaign. So, I mean, that's lesson number one. And everybody, this isn't anything I'm coming up with. If you just read how to run a successful Kickstarter campaign, you know, Google it and you'll get these same sorts of suggestions. But, you know, having an audience going into it, it's very rare that someone runs a Kickstarter campaign that doesn't, you know, on day one already have some sort of an audience in place. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe that's just a, a, a big network of friends and family. Um, maybe it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or something like that where you can bring some of your fans in to help. But that's the main thing, I think, with Kickstarter is having, say, established following so that you know you're not just starting at ground zero on the first day of the Kickstarter campaign. Um, you know, some of the other lessons I learned, um, you know, I'm in Los Angeles, so I would say things are maybe a little different here. If you're not in Los Angeles, you know, you might be in a slightly different situation. But, you know, one of the things you always hear um, for low-budget film is, oh, keep the cast very small. And I would say if you're in Los Angeles, um, I try to keep my cast small, but truthfully, being in Los Angeles, there's so many talented actors that just want to work, uh, even on a super low-budget project, that if you're in Los Angeles and you can get professional actors inexpensively or, or for free, I think that's something you can kind of expand. And I, 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 on my next project, I'm worrying a lot less about the cast because I basically know being shooting in Los Angeles, I, there's a lot of actors that I'll be able to call on. Not even people I know. I mean, you can just put up casting notices um, through the breakdown service or even something like Craigslist, and you can find tons and tons of experienced professional actors that will come out and help you. If you're outside of L.A., I don't know. I think it's going to be tougher, and I think if you're going to shoot outside of L.A., um, you know, maybe in New York or something, or Chicago, where there's a big city and there's like an arts, you know, a real scene, acting scene or something, maybe you could get away with it. But if you're not shooting in L.A. or New York, I would say that's when you probably would want to have a smaller cast because it's going to be tough. For even for a small role, it's going to be tough to get a good actor. And that's one of the things that makes low-budget films look really low-budget is having really bad acting. So, <laughs> you know, again, if you're thinking about making a film, I would say think about that. The one thing I found in Los Angeles, the sort of the flip side to that coin is it was difficult to find locations. Every time I went to, we needed a little 
dumpy motel to shoot in. And, you know, you walk into the hotel, this little dumpy motel, and I'm like, yeah, sure, you can shoot here. You know, it's $4,000 a day. Well, on a budget of 30000 you can't spend $4,000 a day just for the location. And mm-hmm. that's the problem in Los Angeles is, you know, CBS Studios and Universal Pictures, you know, they're showing up at these same locations, and they have deep pockets, and they can't afford the $4,000 a day. So everybody in Los Angeles, it's very sophisticated when it comes to, you know, getting meals and getting the food and the locations and that kind of stuff. And they want to get paid. They want to get paid top dollar. So that was one of my biggest hurdles was getting a location essentially for free. At the end of the day, I had to basically just use locations that I could get through friends and family. Um, now, I think, again, the flip side of that is if you're not shooting in Los Angeles, I think you, you can have, I've heard from people, they have the opposite experience. You know, outside of Los Angeles, people think shooting a film is a cool thing. So it's very easy to go into a restaurant or some sort of a business to, hey, can we shoot our movie here? And if you just do a little product place, so maybe you tell them, hey, we're going to, we'll feature your restaurant, we'll have a cut of the sign so people know it's your restaurant or something, give you a little promotion in this movie. I think outside of LA, that can work and you can actually mm-hmm. get some of the stuff. I've heard stories of people, you know, in smaller towns, you know, you'll get free food, all kinds of just free services. Because, you know, in smaller towns outside of L.A., people just think it's cool to shoot a movie. Um, but in L.A., that was one of the bigger challenges was just getting the, um, you know, getting the locations. Because, again, I just kept going up to some of these places and it just it was just not feasible. Um, and there was just no way of explaining to them, listen, this is a low budget project. They just had no interest. Like there was no glamour. There's no sexiness to it. You know, in L.A., they got movie shooting at their dumpy motel all the time. So, you know, a little thirty two thousand dollar movie is not exciting to them. Um, right. So I don't know, that's kind of maybe some of the ups and downs I had with it. Right, right. And you make a very interesting point across the board with 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 all the the obstacles there, especially with money location. And you're, you're correct on New York and Los Angeles seems to be prime uh, resources for picking up actors. And you have mentioned <laughs> Craigslist. Uh, this is the second time I'm hearing Craigslist used as a reference I, for one, never would have thought of that. It, it seems unorthodox, but mm-hmm. of course, digging through all the whatever that may be lurking on Craigslist, you do find some talented actors and actresses. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and to be honest, again, another little tip. I mean, I bet, you know, two thirds of my crew came through Craigslist, just Craigslist ads. I mean, I've been in LA for a while. So I mm-hmm. knew some people, you know, I was able to bring some and I networked a little bit. So it wasn't everybody, but I bet two thirds of my crew was just cold Craigslist ads. You know, we need a production designer. We need a costume designer. We need some production assistants. Um, and just throwing those ads up on Craigslist and, you know, you get a bunch of responses, at least in LA, you get for any kind of a um, position. If you can offer even $50 a day, for some of these predictions, um, some of these positions, you'll get, you know, just dozens of people submitting. Um, so again, I think being in LA is very helpful. Just like with the actors, you can find really talented crew that they just want to work. They want to get experience. They want to be on set, um, you know, just honing their craft. Um, so again, that's another tip. Yeah. Craigslist was, was a real savior for, for my production. <laughs> cool. And now since, you're the second person to confirm Craigslist. I'm going to check out Craigslist uh-huh. now for future production. For sure. Uh, and, you know, and, and I'll give you even another little tip. Um, I actually have option scripts through Craigslist as well. There's a section in Craigslist for um, writing gigs and um, especially short films. There's a lot of guys, you know, they don't have access to the big agencies or anything like that. And they'll just go, you know, a producer, and maybe he's a year out of film school and he just wants to go do a short film. He'll put an ad on Craigslist in the, Los Angeles or the New York writing gig section. And you'll see all the time. You could go there now. I can almost guarantee you there'll be two or three um, lists. And again, Craigslist is a free resource. And these are not going to be like high-end productions, obviously. But right. if you're a screenwriter just starting out, this is a great way to get some of your stuff produced. Write some short films and start submitting them to um, to these directors and these producers that are putting these ads on Craigslist. And, you know, if they're even halfway decently and you're, you're persistent with your submissions, um, you'll get some produced credits. And a lot of those you know, shorts, they'll end up on IMDb, they'll end up at film festivals, um, and you'll get to meet the filmmakers that are doing them. So it's just kind of a win-win, um, oh, right. you know, for everybody, even though you're not going to necessarily make a lot of money with them. Right. You have to start somewhere, and the best way to start yeah. is from the bottom. You're not going to start from the top. Yeah. I think we hear those yeah. stories in yeah. fairy tales. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you know that's and that's the thing is that we hear these big splashy stories of you know someone just getting plucked out of obscurity, and right. and it does happen. You know, occasionally it does happen, but if you really look at most of the people who succeed, they started kind of at the bottom. You know, they worked their way up in a more normal thing. But that's not like a sexy story. So that's not the story that we hear the most of. We always hear these sort of you know incredible come out of nowhere stories, and we think that's how it's done, but it's really not. Um, you know, it's the tried and true. It's it's persistence, it's consistency, and it's you know just sticking with it over the course of, of months and years and, and perhaps decades. Uh, yeah, and that, that is the same exact statement from my previous interviewee. They had stated, "Hey, it, you don't hear the stories of the person grinding for 15 years and then all of a sudden they make it. They think, oh, that person just made it out of the blue.' No, it's it takes a lot, as you had mm -hmm. mentioned, also." persistence consistency especially with content online content podcast building a an, a reputable name as a journalist that all dedicates time and effort every day content not the weekend weekends is obsolete in this field yeah yeah exactly for sure and with with the pinch your directorial debut it seems it reads on indb uh Putting the cast and everything together, uh, how long was it to really get everything from script to screen? Yeah, I, I would say it was the better part of three years. Now, I could have definitely gone a lot quicker, especially with the post-production, sort of once we got the movie shot. I could have gone a lot quicker. Um, but just just quickly, I would say I probably probably took me you know six or nine months to write the script. Um And then I did my Kickstarter in January. So let's say, you know, I think that might have been 2015. I did, um, I wrote the script. And then 2016, in January, I ran, the, maybe February, it's January, February, so I ran the Kickstarter. We then shot in July of 2016. We shot the movie in July of 2016. Then we went into post-production. And I had a pretty good cut. By the end of that year, end of 2016, I had a pretty good cut. But There's this old adage in filmmaking, you know, the, the the good, fast, and cheap. You can have two of them, but you can never have three of them. You know, mm. if you want it to be good, it's it's not going to be fast, or it's not. It's either going to be expensive, or it's going to be slow. And so I knew I wanted to make my film good, obviously. So I just didn't put any real timelines on the various post production positions. I just want, told them going into it, listen, there's no rush on this thing just do as do a good job let's just do as good as we can given our, given the restraint um mm -hmm. so things took a lot longer than they perhaps could have or should have and then it's a typical thing so i basically had the film done about a year ago and then i did the, the film festival submissions and you know you start waiting for the film festivals to get back to you and right. we got into a couple of festivals we did a nice screening um this past august at action on film and then once that kind of played out then i started this Past fall, I started getting into, um, you know, getting the film, preparing the film for actual distribution and, um, and getting it into the various services. And that's kind of where I am now is, um, you know, we're just slowly we're rolling out to all the various VOD platforms right now as we speak. Right. Which one includes uh, Amazon Prime and uh, congrats on that Correct. once again. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Amazon Prime and um, iTunes, Vudu, Google Play. I don't know if we're up on Vudu yet. I think Vudu is one that we still have to roll out on. But um, we're up on iTunes and Amazon right now. And as I said, we'll be rolling out more of these. And I'm still trying to find, and that's basically like your VOD distribution, and I'm still trying to find like more of an international distributor, um, someone who will try and do the sales outside of the U.S. Um, and that will be like, you know, cable TV in Europe or something like that. Um, some other outlets, not necessarily the VOD stuff, but there are still, you know, TV channels or, or those kinds of things that, um, that do still play in, in other countries. So I'm still pursuing that as well. Oh, the, and before I jump into my next question, it seems like <clears throat> not only uh, do you serve as director, writer, it seems like you were in all the hats to really promote this film, getting uh, contracts for distribution and, and everything else that goes behind this production. Yeah, and that's um yeah, and that's pretty much sums it up. I mean, for sure. I mean, this was my my movie and I definitely had a lot of help from a lot of really talented cool people, um mm -hmm. friends and family. I mean, my mom and dad were doing the craft services and the meals and stuff. Um so, you know, it was all hands on deck. So, I definitely um 
I definitely yeah, a lot to be thankful for. And as I said, I just I couldn't have asked for a better cast and crew. But at the end of the day, it did fall on sort of my shoulders to just get this thing over the finish line. Um, you know, I wrote the script and, and raised the money and, and, and ultimately put the put the thing together. But um, but there's this I mean, it's a very I mean, as I'm sure, you know, and anyone listening to this is, is knows it's um, it's a very collaborative me- medium and you really do need the help of other people. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote it, directed it, um, but couldn't have done it without, um, the, all the other talented people that were involved. Oh yeah, absolutely. And huge applause to them. And as I mentioned, seen the film and very close, very small crew, uh, of, of cast members. And that is really emphasizes the storyline and, I find that when there is too many characters involved in the story, it really models the story. And the question here is, you have a very interesting character arc with the protagonist. He seems to have uh, gotten himself into a very interesting predicament. Uh, So how did that all come together to really craft this important feature for the script? Yeah. And so, you know, again, as, as we've been talking, I mean, my background really is screenwriting and it's nice you know, to hear a question like that, because, you know, there was quite a bit of just time and energy and, you know, making sure that, because screenplays are about a journey. Like at the end of the day, you know, mm-hmm. Star Wars, yeah, it's about blowing up the Death Star, but it's really <laughs> about Luke's journey, his, right. you know, getting away from Tantooine and breaking away. And so, you know, that's such just an important, like screenwriting 101 is, you know, having that character arc in place with, um, with your protagonist. And I, you know, it's hard to say exactly how you form that or, or how you create it. But, you know, making sure you're very aware of that point as mm-hmm. you start to craft your story, you're kind of always looking at that. I mean, you're looking at sort of what is the story about? And, you know, I think the original concept was sort of about, you know, I knew I wanted something low budget. So frankly, that probably impacted a lot of my creative choices, certainly early on. It's like, okay, I need two guys basically in a house. One guy's taking the other guy prison. And then you just, you know, you kind of set up. And I think that probably came before understanding what Rob, Rob was my protagonist, what his character arc is going to look like. Um, but just as you write various drafts, as you start to go through it, as you start to get to know the characters, um, you start to understand that, okay, this is what this story is. It's about a guy struggling, you know, just to kind of move up the ranks and, um, and, and, and he was promised something that this guy's not deliver. So he finally is just pushed to the brink where he has to do something and has to take action and ultimately learns a lesson. And I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's a very much, um, you know, it's not, at least for me, and maybe other writers are different, but for me, it's not like a, um, a light bulb goes off. You know, just, aha, this is the brilliant idea I just came up with. It's much more about sort of evolving these things. And, you know, when I'm writing a script, I start out with just, it's, at this point, it's like a Google Doc, you know, and it goes mm-hmm. on for almost ever. And I just start writing notes. And I, you know, I have different sections. I have a character section and a story slash structure section. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'll start the project by laying out those beats. Typically, it's the Blake Snyder beat sheet. He's got like 12 beats um, that kind of just, keep your story on track from a structure standpoint. So I'll lay that into the, um, to the, to the story structure section. And then as I start to go with the characters, I'll just, you know, put the character's name, Rob, and I'll just start to put notes. What type of a character is he? What is his arc? You know, and just any little notes and things as I get to know them. And this goes on, you know, for weeks and months before I actually start writing the script. Um, So, you know, you start with something loose, but again, it's not, for me, anyways, it's not like a light bulb going out or I'm just, you know, light strikes. It feels much more like a sort of organic process that right. evolves over quite a bit of time. And slowly you start to see these things. And then, you know, you can draw them out. Once you realize that this is Rob's character, then you can go back and you can tweak it and you can enhance it and you can really sort of pull it out so that it's, it's more, you know, it becomes you become more aware of it, and so you can make those tweaks to the script to sort of enhance it and um, and really pull it out. Absolutely, and that's what I notice about the pinch is Rob is a, a regular average guy. He doesn't possess the uh, martial arts skills, or he's a sharpshooter. He's just a regular guy going through an unfortunate situation, 
And one of the things that you have noted is tr- building this character for a script. You, there always has to be that element of the human element. And with the antagonist, we know what his favorite pizza brand is. And those are the little subtleties that as a screenwriter, you have to insert into the script so it makes them feel human and we could relate to them on some type of level that we could connect with as, a, as an audience, as a viewer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and that little bit you're mentioning is, um, it's, yeah, it's the, it's the antagonist in, in the case of my script that has a very particular, you know, type of pizza that he likes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all, I, I totally agree. It's all those little character moments. Um, you know, when you see those in your daily life and, you know, as a writer, you know, you got to take notice of those things. You notice those little quirks that people have, those little mm-hmm. things that people do that define them as a character. And, you know, you try and just bank those and, and, um, kind of keep those in your memory. And, and as you're developing your own characters, you can kind of pull those out The you know, the person that's very particular, they won't eat this pizza no matter what, um, you know, and that sort of defines you that type of a person. We all know that as opposed to, you know, like myself, I'm like a really non-picky eater, so I'll eat about anything, you know, and, and that kind of maybe defines me a little bit. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, um, it is. It's all those little small moments in our lives that um, can hopefully connect the audience to the material. Right. And with the pinch of being the director of your own film, uh, what would some of the lessons learned from filming the pinch that you would be taking over for your next project? Yeah. So I would say the biggest lesson is, you know, I was really the main producer on the pinch as well. So I was mm-hmm. writing, directing, and also doing a lot of the producing. Um, wow. And, and it just, it was too much. And so for my next project, I just, you know, the, the problem is like the logistical things, the sort of the technical logistical thing. Those are issues that are very much front and center. And so when they come up, you have to solve them and you have to kind of, you know, there's nothing you can do. And as the the main producer, I was sort of constantly worrying about those things. And for my next one, I want to kind of remove that so I can really focus on the creative things. There's a number of things in the pinch where, you know, if I just had a little more time or a little more focus, I Mm -hmm. think we could have done a little bit better. Um, Mm. And again, it just, it was just wearing too many hats. So I would say that's sort of the biggest lesson. Um, the biggest lesson learned. The other lesson that I would say I learned is, and maybe this is more as a producer director kind of a lesson as opposed to just a director lesson. But, you know, as I said, you know, in Los Angeles, there's just, there's so many people that, you know, just want to work and they're not that worried about making money. Like most people don't go into the entertainment business. They just do it for the same reason I did it, which is to say they just love movies. And as, right. no matter what field, you know, or what position you're in on a movie, you know, there's this sort of, Everyone kind of just really loves movies and, and they want to work. They want to do cool projects. And that was a big lesson because in a lot of cases, like I don't consider myself like a born leader or someone that, you know, can go out there and rally people and get people motivated. I'm mm-hmm. kind of an introvert. I'm, I come, I'm a screenwriter, so I like to just sit at my desk and type. But the lesson I really learned was that, you know, we all kind of feel like that. None of, no one really wants to take that leadership role and just head things up. But if you're willing to do it, there are people that will – to happily follow you and happily help out because um, mm-hmm. there's this this shared love of movies and shared love of doing creative things and if you're willing to take that step and be a leader and put something together um, even though it may not be sort of in your nature and again I don't consider it to really be in my nature um, but I just remember sort of being on set you know people would come up to me and ask me questions and I was just kind of like I don't have any idea you know but I'm supposed right. to be the leader here and so they were looking to me and I just and I just had this moment where I thought, you know, anybody on set has the capability of doing this. It's just a matter of, you know, not being afraid to go out there and do it. Because um, it's going to be nerve wracking and there's going to be some times where you feel really insecure and mm-hmm. you don't know. I mean, people are asking you questions that you have no real good answers for um, and, and they're looking to you for things. But you just got to get out there and do the best you can. And everybody understands that. I mean, there's, you know, we're making a low budget movie. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be some hiccups. Um, you know, you know, one of the actors like, Hey, is there a policeman? Like, Hey, where's our police badges or whatever? It's like, yeah, we couldn't afford police badges. You know, mm-hmm. the, the getting mock police badges was, was difficult. I mean, these are just, you know, little things that, um, that come up and, you know, it just, you got to just be able to answer it in a confident way. And, and, um, people accept it again, everyone just wants to do cool projects. And if you're willing to be the leader, um, you can get people to, um, to come along with you and, and help out 
and be a part of the process. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely uh, right on the ball. And for, as a screenwriter, I know what you're coming from. Sometimes uh, when you're taking thing, taking the project, leading the project, and you have so many questions coming at you in different directions. You know, oh, uh, uh, yeah, I definitely know the feeling. Uh, with the cast, amazing s slate of uh, cast members here, in particular, the lead, Rob, the protagonist, Gunnar Wright, uh, most notable for his voiceover work in Dead Space, the video game franchise. Uh, with that said, how did everybody come together and how did the lead, the lead actor get on board on this project as Rob? Sure. So um, it, there was nothing special about it. I mean, it was pretty straightforward just going through the casting process. And, you know, if people outside of L.A. may not necessarily be that familiar with it, but in, in, in Los Angeles, and maybe it's in, uh, available in other cities as well, I'm not sure, but in L.A. there's something called the Breakdown Services, and you just go to them, you set up an account on their website, and you just start posting casting notices, and this goes out. I mean, the actors all know that this is where the majority of casting notices, and, I mean, big movies will come through this same service. I mean, they're casting the next Steven Spielberg movie, through these mm -hmm. same services. So all the agents, all the managers, and a lot of actors as well um, get a hold of this thing. I think they try and – there's two different sort of levels of it. Um, one can sort of go to agents and managers, and one kind of goes to actors, or you can do, you know, either or both. But in a lot of cases, the actors, they know how to hijack that agent and manager's list, and so they will submit <laughs> directly to you. But essentially, you just set up a casting notice, and you start running casting sessions. And that's how we got um, – almost all the actors came through that. Some of them were friends or people I knew and that kind of stuff. Um, but, but the, the role of Rob, um, he just, he came in and he auditioned and I thought he did a great job. And, you know, we talked to him, we brought him back for a second audition and he seemed like a cool guy. And he, he really was, I mean, he's a very, very prepared actor, you know, very hardworking, um, super nice guy. Um, but there was nothing special in terms of the process. He didn't do anything. I mean, he just came in and gave a great performance he knew his lines. He was professional. He showed up, um, showed up on time, you know, as I said, just really just sort of blew us all away with how good he was. Um, and we cast him, but there was no history there. I mean, I never had met him before, um, before these casting sessions. Oh, wow. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, we do have a resource like that in here in, in New York as well, in which the actors themselves, uh, union and non-union, go through the list of postings whether it be a short film or feature films and hey that's that's a good thing about living in the major cities like this <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah for sure for sure and with the pinch uh what element of reality or something inspired you to write this story this crime thriller and i'm, I'm particularly with the relationship between the protagonist and antagonist, uh, they're good buddies that uh, have met at a very weird decision in their their relationship together. Yeah, you know, and someone asked me that question before, and I don't, I honestly don't remember the sort of the genesis of the idea. Um, again, it was much more sort of an evolving process. Um, the the original scene, I, I don't know why, and I know this is not a great answer to your question. Your question is a good one. I don't have a good answer. But the, I think one of the very, very, very original scenes that I kind of just had was this idea of, of Rob. When the two gangsters come to kill him, he kind of realizes they're there to kill him, and he hides in the house and is kind of trapped in the house. And for some reason, that was sort of the first scene. I just I just thought that would be a cool scene. Um this guy, these guys have come to kill him. They think he's not in the house, and so they think they're waiting for him, but really he's hiding in the house, um, mm. And but he can't get out because they're sitting there. And so for some reason that was just like a scene I came up with that I thought was cool, and I just put it in my um, – I just keep it – again, it's just a Google Doc. I just keep like an idea bank, just any random right. ideas that come up, and some of them are more, you know – are more filled out than that, um, than what I just explained. But then, as I said, as I was going through this process, I, I decided I wanted to write something super low budget. So I went back to my idea bank and I started just going through them, some of the ideas. 
And that one stuck out to me. And I think I sort of combined a few other ideas, um, like maybe the basic sort of plot of Rob being stuck in this house trying to get the ransom. Um, I just, I don't really remember the exact, um, again, sort of the genesis of it, but that's kind of how it came together. I mean, it was me just banking uh, random ideas in this Google Doc, and then at some point me saying, well, I got to do something super low budget. So then going back through this idea bank and just looking at the ideas there and kind of thinking about how I could put them to use in a, um, in a micro budget film. Right. Yeah. And for, for that idea, that's one of the things that uh, really shine in the pinch. As I mentioned earlier, uh, he's just a regular average guy and he uh, hides from the bad guys that are in his home at, um, it gets tired when you see that scenario played out and you see the the protagonist just kicking ass. Like, oh, okay, well, basically he's going to survive to the end of the story. We don't need to worry about him. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, with the pinch, uh, you had mentioned that you had went on uh, crowdfunding, and I see there is a, just a 50-50 margin, especially when it comes to feature films, uh, indie feature films, low budget fin- feature films, is that a good reference for filmmakers to jump on uh, to get funding for their projects? Well, what do you mean 50 50? Well, there is the doubts that the crowdfunding campaign is uh, digital panhandling and they some filmmakers I, stray I, away from that yeah, while others no, find I, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I see what you're saying. So, um, so yes, it, it, and doing a Kickstarter campaign, that's the biggest drawback. Like the good news is you, people give you money to make your movie. The bad mm-hmm. news is, is you basically got to go out there and beg for money for a month. You <laughs> yeah, know? I heard and, that. and it yeah. does feel a little bit, it, it feels a little bit like panhandling and it feels a little bit dirty and it feels a little bit unsavory and it's not my favorite thing to do. Um, you know, that's all very, very much true, but, um, you know, again, it's just part of the process. And I think even though it does make most of us feel uncomfortable, um, you know, that's ultimately what will separate a lot of the winners and from the losers. Um, are you willing to do something that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable? And, mm-hmm. and in this case, is go out and raise money. And believe me, it's not, I mean, it's not any different if you have to do it like with friends and family. Hey, can you invest in my movie? I mean, that's going to be an awkward conversation to have as well. And that's going to feel right. very much like panhandling. So there's not really that much getting around with. Now, if you can get to the point where you have like a viable business model where you've made movies and sold movies, then it becomes a very different type of a thing. But when mm-hmm. you're really just starting out, you, you can't in any real sense offer anybody a return on their investment. I mean, if you've never made a film before, the chances you're going to make your money back. Like if you're telling people, oh, this is going to be the ROI, I mean, maybe you're lying to yourself, maybe you're lying to them, but there, there is virtually no chance that on a first film, you're actually, a first independent film, you're actually going to make the money back. So, you know, I think doing something like Kickstarter is not a bad way to do it um, because, Again, it's a sort of a grassroots thing, and I think people that are supporting you through Kickstarter, um, they understand that these things are, it's not, you're not doing it because you're expecting an ROI. I mean, you're not going to get any money back if you donate on Kickstarter, so you're not doing it for that reason. And I think for early in a filmmaker's career, I think that's a good thing because the fact of the matter is if they're, you know, their rich uncle cuts them a check for 100 grand, the rich uncle in all likelihood is not going to see that money back. And right. that may not be quite clear from the start. If you go through Kickstarter, it's at least clear that you're not going to get your money back. It's more about just being a part of this cool project. I would still go back to what I said earlier, though, about having an audience. I mean, I just, I don't see, I, I, you never know. Again, it's going to depend on your, your, your friends and family, your network of friends and family and that right. kind of thing. But if you don't have any sort of an audience, like I don't, I've never heard of a Kickstarter for a film just actually working if they just, you know, just throwing it out there. And I've seen, and I get emails because, you know, I have my own blog and podcast. And so I get emails all the time. from people. Oh, I'm doing my Kickstarter. I'm trying to raise, right. you know, $100,000. And, you know, I go to the Kickstarter. And, and I like to support filmmakers. So I, I donate to a lot of Kickstarter campaigns. But if I go there and they're trying to raise $100,000 and they've only raised, you know, $65 in the last 10 days, it's like, yeah, you know, you're being a little bit unrealistic. And right. that's the next piece 
that I would say to answer your question is you have to be realistic about what you can actually raise on Kickstarter. And I think I did a pretty good job of that. And that's important because it sets expectations and it mm -hmm. just puts you in sort of a realistic frame of mind. And in my case, I made my goal $12,000. And the way that I came to that um, number was I did a little bit of Googling and I don't remember the exact resource, but I found somewhere on Google, um, somewhere someone had a, you know, tips for doing your Kickstarter campaign. And I can't remember exactly the math, but I think they, they said it was some sort of a formula. And, and if, if, if my math is off, I apologize, but it was something to the effect of like, if 6% and keep this key, understand what I'm saying, 6% of your audience. So you have to have a big audience. If 6% of your audience averages a $20 donation, you know, that's like a realistic number to expect. And in mm -hmm. my case, I had about I had an email list from selling your screenplay, doing the selling your screenplay um, podcast and blog for years. I had an email list of about ten thousand screenwriters on it, and so I did some simple math: six percent times ten thousand times twenty dollars per person, and it came to twelve thousand. Again, the six percent and the twenty dollars per person; those numbers might be off. I don't remember specifically, but the bottom line was it was a very low percentage of the of the number of that list of 10,000 people, it was like, you know, around five, if I could just get 5% of them to donate like about $20, that's going to be my goal. So that's how I came up with that 12,000 thing. And now obviously the budget of your film may or may not correlate to that number. And in my case, it didn't, but I didn't feel like I could actually raise more than 12,000. So I knew, okay, it's going to fall on me. I'm going to just have to personally kick in that money. But that's right. another big tip I would give people that want to do Kickstarter campaigns is be realistic. If you've got a network of, you know, a hundred people from high school and college and, and friends and family, like, I don't think you're going to, I mean, unless one of them is going to, or two of them are going to come in and really give big, big dollar amounts. Um, that's going to be tough to raise ten or twenty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you know, unless you have something really in the wings for something like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have a big list. So that's again the the big thing is just be realistic with what you're going to do. And the other thing is it's a lot of work. I mean, not only do you feel a little bit, you know, shady doing this, you're panhandling, begging for money for a month. It's a lot of work to ramp the Kickstarter campaign up. I mean, you've got to keep engaging your audience. And and what I tried to do was just be really transparent about my process and you can actually go back and listen to all these podcasts. Um, again, it would have been early 2016 and I talk about all of these, these things that I'm doing with the Kickstarter campaign and I was doing extra podcasts and I was sending out emails to my list. Um, but you know, you have to kind of constantly during that 30 day period where you're doing your Kickstarter, it's a lot of work to just keep engaging your audience, trying to come up with, you know, creative, ways of, of making things interesting so that they're, you know, interested in actually checking out your page and, and potentially giving money. So, you know, that's something to think about too. If you're going to only, if you're going to only raise, you think you can, I mean, if your network is small and you can only raise, you know, you think you're about $500,000, you know, I don't know that the amount of hours it's going to take you to, you know, run your Kickstarter campaign. I don't know that it really justifies the, um, the, the thousand dollars that you, you are going to raise. So again, Think through how big your audience is. Do some simple math on that and see if it's realistic and see if it's even worth doing. I mean, if you're going to have to spend, you know, a hundred hours to raise a thousand dollars, I don't know that's worth it. Even at minimum wage, you know, right. you could get a minimum wage job and earn that thousand dollars in a hundred hours. So, you know, there's some calculus that needs to be done about how big your audience is um, versus how much time you're going to have to spend to actually get your audience engaged. Mm. Thank you for that breakdown. I wasn't aware that there was some a percentage behind it, and uh, I'm a math to me is hieroglyphics. I, I let my wife do the mathematics, but the advice there is <laughs> is so valuable. There, thank you for that. And it's true what you said. Sure. If if you have unrealistic goals, that also applies to your overall production. If you're trying to make, well, of course we have resources and and programs that can do it. But if you're starting out and you want to make the next Star Wars, sure you can, but that costs money. It's best as you start small, create a short film perhaps, and perhaps you're not making a Star Wars movie. Maybe you're making a, a movie grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. And, you know, the, the other piece to that, and it sort of plays into what you just said, is that 
and, and plays into what I just said in the sense that if you set your goal at $300,000 and people go there and after 10 days they see you've only raised, you know, $1,000, mm-hmm. it, it makes people think you don't know what you're doing. Right. You know, it's like, it, it, you know, it, and then, and like, as I said, when people send me these emails, if someone sends me an email, hey, I'm doing a Kickstarter campaign, I'll almost always click on the link and just go check it out. But again, if I see that the person is just way outside of reality, I'm like, why would I give money to that when <laughs> right. they I can't even convince me that they've done even, you know, they're just a dreamer. They're just a wannabe dreamer. If you're trying to raise $300,000 and you've never done a Kickstarter campaign, it's just, it's, you're just not even living on planet earth. And that doesn't make, that doesn't inspire me to go and give money to your campaign. Whereas if I go on there and, you know, you're trying to raise $15,000 and, you know, you're in the first 10 days and you've already raised 8,000. I'm sitting there thinking that this, this guy's probably going to get there. He seems, you know, like he knows what he's doing. And that mm-hmm. instills the confidence. And that's, you know, you need to, at all levels of this, you need to show people that you are competent and serious about this. And, you know, doing these outrageous things where, oh, I'm going to raise $300,000. Oh, but it's such a cool project. Look at my video. It's so cool. It's like, yeah. You know, it's just, it may be a cool project, but you just have not given me the confidence that you can actually execute it. Um, and part of that, again, is, is being realistic with what you can actually raise and expect from, from this audience. I've never heard, you know, with Kickstarter, I've never heard of a Kickstarter campaign just really going viral and taking off, except mm-hmm. for the products. And that's the other right. thing. Right. You know, the, the, the cooler and that Pebble Beach watch, those, those, are products and you know you have to sort of remember and understand what Kickstarter really is. Kickstarter is really it's it's almost a way of pre-selling your product. And so that Pebble Beach watch was an interview that there was that cool the cooler cooler or whatever. It was an innovative product. They had a super slate video, but it was an innovative product and essentially all you were doing was pre-ordering the product. And right. that's a much, much easier sell than trying to basically get someone to pre-order your movie, which may or may not even be any good at the end of the day. You, you know, the movie, I mean, the viewing experience is what you're paying for, and it may not be good, and you can't give that away for free, but yet people, you know, it's a, it's a different thing. So with the movies, you've got to do everything you can to instill that confidence. Make people understand that you are smart, you are competent, and you know what you're doing. And that starts from at the very beginning of, of, of setting your goals, setting the budget for the film. Um, you know, again, if I'm looking at a filmmaker and they've never made a film and they're trying to raise a million dollars, I'm like, you know, <laughs> even the most talented filmmaker in the world, you would be crazy to give them a million dollars if they've right. never made a film, no matter how much talent you have. Cause it's just, it's, it would be irresponsible. I mean, it just, you, you don't know what you're doing until you've actually done it. And, you know, <clears throat> Just starting out, people think, oh, it's just, you know, and we have examples. I mean, what's the guy that did District 9? You know, that was a, whatever, $20, $30 million movie. I think he had maybe done a short or something, and then, you know, the studio handed him $20, $30 million. It was a great movie, and, you know, it made money, and so, you know, kudos to that. But, again, that's sort of the anomaly, Um, and there's probably a lot more subtlety and complexity to that than we know as an outsider who was not – privy to exactly what was going on. But the other big thing on a 20 or $30 million movie is you've got so many super professional and experienced people you're working with. Even if the director is not that experienced, they can probably push him over the finish line. Um, but these things start, as I said, at the very beginning, just showing people that you're smart, you're competent, and you're realistic will instill confidence. And I think that will help you um, with your Kickstarter campaign. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, just to to close off uh, the, the the Kickstarter conversation, uh, there is also the other side in which you do have the audience, and I've seen it a couple of times, not in the film industry, but in the video game field, where they they garner or they exceed their goal, they put out their product, and it doesn't meet expectations, and now you have all these angry audiences that contributed to your project. Mm-hmm. Say, oh, what, what what was this? <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, yeah. That's sure. also the flip side of of the whole Kickstarter thing. Uh, but op- open open yeah. platform. I mean, I think both. I think I think I think both those examples I mentioned, the Cooler Cooler and the Pelby Watch. I think both of those companies had big problems. I think the Cooler Cooler. I don't think they could deliver the Cooler 
that was their problem. They couldn't, they, they underestimated the cost of these things. Mm. And so they actually could not deliver them for the amount of money that they could sell. So that's a whole, a whole but a bunch of other problems. But the, my main point with that is that you're actually seeing a phys- you're, you're essentially buying a physical product that you right. can see in the video. And it's a much different thing than sort of buying an unknown product, which you may or may not enjoy, which is a movie and movies have become you know, they're just so ubiquitous and we can go on Netflix and there's literally more movies than you can watch in a lifetime. So right. it just, it's a much harder sell, um, selling a movie on Kickstarter, pre-selling a movie on Kickstarter is a much harder sell than, um, than those physical products. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, a couple of questions to close out the interview. The first question is, uh, as a writer and now you are releasing your first film, The Pinch, are will you be exploring uh, other platforms such as uh, YouTube or Facebook to create a series or create short films, or will you be strictly in uh, video on demand or streaming uh, feature films? Yeah, you know, it's a good question, and I'm open to about anything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so I will definitely. I'll try and explore YouTube. I mean, YouTube has a paid section. Now, I don't think, like, I don't know that I ever, you know, for, I don't never is a long time, so I don't know. But in the short term, at least, I don't have any intention of releasing the pinch for free on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that, what that would really get me. Um, I did do a, a three hour webinar, the making of the pinch, and I recorded it. And I actually did, I'm selling that through my website. So, it's like a five dollar upsell if you buy the movie. Um, mm. So you know, there's little things like that that I'm trying to explore that I think are maybe new and novel. Um, but the nice thing about the Amazon Prime is it's um, you know it's not new or novel anymore, but it's a kind of a, a fairly mature market. And I knew going into it, like that's really for like an ind- low budget independent film like The Pinch. That's really where most of the money is going to be made is Amazon Prime. Because mm. you can kind of plug into what Amazon already has going, and they basically pay you for every minute that someone watches your your film, you get a fraction of a penny, um, and hopefully that adds up. And if your film is good, you know people will watch the movie to the end. If your film yeah. is not good, then then maybe they won't. Um, but the nice thing about the Amazon market is it's not new and novel. I'm open to trying something that would be new and novel, certainly. Um, but it's nice to kind of have that that avenue out there, which um, as I said, it's probably going to be the main place where we make some of our money back. Right. And, and interesting enough that you mentioned that you have a, a three hour uh, behind the scenes of the pension. That's, that's one aspect where uh, most filmmakers don't think about is a, the making of process. A lot, that is so much valuable information right there. The, the behind the scenes and how you get the project off the ground that, I would pay five dollars just to watch that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, other people will as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just you know, just coming up with creative ways of of marketing and selling these types of films is is definitely something that I do. You know, I just I'm sitting here lying awake in bed, you know, and you just try and come up with what could I try, what are ideas, and I've got a couple of things that um, I'm going to roll out. Facebook being one of them. Um, not so much showing it on Facebook. But I met a guy at AFM, the American Film Market, right. and um, he had done a bunch of Facebook ads just to, to push them over to Amazon. Because, mm-hmm. again, you get a fraction of a penny when you push, when someone watches over an Amazon. So if you can figure out the metrics on that, you might be able to get some money. But even if you're not making money on the Facebook ads, um, you might be able to generate some reviews or some more watches. And then the, uh, the Amazon algorithm might also pick it up and, um, and start to recommend it. So there's some things like that that I'm definitely going to try. Um, once once the film is fully released, right? And open platform to close out the interview, uh, pitch the pinch, uh, social media platforms and where sure. platforms where audiences can see the pinch uh, on streaming platforms. Sure. So um, as we mentioned earlier, it's on. It will be rolling out to all the main ones if there's not already there, but iTunes and Amazon, as I said, Vudu and Google Play will be on there. Within the next couple of weeks, we'll be on all four of those. I also am selling the movie directly from my website, and that's where you can actually bundle. Again, for an extra five bucks, you can bundle this three-hour webinar, and that's literally just sellingyourscreenplay.com slash 
The Pinch. It's all lowercase, all one word. Just selling your screenplay.com slash The Pinch. And you can buy the movie there without the webinar. You can buy whatever's convenient. I just tried to make, you know, just get it out there on as many platforms as possible so that whatever's convenient for you, hopefully, um, you know, my movie will be available in that, um, in that whatever you prefer to do it. Just in terms of my social media, um, on Twitter, I think I'm Ashley Myers. Um, but if you go to sellingyourscreenplay.com, in the upper right-hand corner, all my little social media icons are there, the Twitter, my IMDb, my Instagram, my YouTube channel, um, all of that stuff is there. And so, you know, if you want to learn more about me or what I'm doing, um, that's a good way to do it. My podcast, again, that's on sellingyourscreenplay.com. But um, I do a little section, not every week, but, but you know, most weeks I'll do a, like a little update, um, just kind of what I'm doing as a filmmaker and, and a screenwriter and what's going on in my career. So if you're curious just to learn a little bit more about me, I would highly recommend, too, that maybe you check out a couple of my podcast episodes. Uh, great. I will be doing that myself because I – one thing I enjoy about these uh, conducting these interviews and following up is the learning process. Uh, from the writer's standpoint, I could definitely relate to that. The acting, there's so much to be learned in this field. It is, every day is a learning experience, and if you're not learning, uh, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, never stop learning. That's sound advice. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for all this rich information about your film. Best, uh, all the best to you, and definitely looking forward to your upcoming projects. Perfect. Well, Ken, I really appreciate you taking time to uh, talk to me as well. This was a um, good interview, and, and um, it's much appreciated on my end as well. The Pinch. Antagonist Impressions. Now we're going to shed a spotlight on the antagonist. In this segment, it's all about the bad guy. Pain. Mm, what can I say about this guy? Well, for being such a tough guy, he wasn't such a tough guy. In my opinion, I felt that this character was not as tough as he should be. He was not threatening in any way whatsoever. But... Maybe it's because he had a friendship with Rob and that changed the whole dynamic on whether or not he was going to kill him or not. Mm. But I can't reveal too much in the third act of the final the final act of the film when things start getting out of control. But throughout the whole film, he just doesn't seem intimidating to me. So, Stacy, what are your thoughts on this guy? Well, Kane is definitely a split personality from Rob. He's the opposite. Um, he was about as fierce as a barking dog. And um, as you, well, like, you know that whole saying where right. um, the, the quiet, the quiet, beware of the quiet people. Yeah. Well, so here, Kane just, He's just loud and yelling and just talking off at the mouth. So in that aspect, I feel like, okay, well, Rob is not even intimidated anymore. Like he is because he knows what he's in store for, you know, because Kane just keeps threatening him. Um, So after a while, the threats just kind of grow numb and he grows numb with them. But um, his personality right his personality uh his character uh, is definitely uh more it's more intimidating than rob's i can say um he wasn't very intimidating um but he was more intimidating than rob like you know if i was in rob's place and he was saying okay i'm gonna kill you i would believe him <laughs> you right. know <laughs> he just had that yeah that whole demeanor to him like I said, as it went on, you're just like, oh, guy, hush, please. He just right. kept, like, kind of reminding him, just like that voice in the back of your head, remember, uh, you're going to die. Remember, you're never going to get away with this. Remember, I'm going to come for you. And then after a while, you're just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. <laughs> yes, that's that's how Kane felt uh, with me. He... There should have been something else to make this character more intimidating. Uh, in the beginning of the film, make him, I don't know, shoot up a hotel room. But then now, 
then it would change the whole dynamic of the film because as I was saying this film is low key you don't have no shootouts but something something is missing from Kane to make the audience say this is a tough guy don't fuck with him he's a tough guy but as you had noted Stacy very well his bark he's all bark 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 throughout the whole film and no action whatsoever and that's pretty much I think Rob felt comfortable keeping him captive he had no worries he hell he even gave him a low grade pizza and that's that's how non-threatening he thought Kane was right but also in the movie you don't really um get to see what Kane is all about right um, you know I mean you see Scotty and Darren you see them in their roles and you're like okay you know these guys mean business especially Scotty um as you know Darren uh, as movie progresses has a change of heart but uh you know Scotty you you see him in his tough guy role so you know he's all about business you know oh um you know I want my bonus I deserve this I deserve you know my money and everything so we're gonna get this done so you see them in action but Kane you don't really see an action you know you just really see him as the hostage right yes you see him as the victim and before he got well the only the only factor here that we see that he was a, a villain was when he was trying to get rid of Rob and it backfired and Kane finds himself in the opposite end of what was going to happen that's the only thing that we see of Kane that he's cold hearted other than that I, I wish there was more emphasis on this character really but the the character and the actor James Aston Lake who portrays Kane I think it, they were well played out nothing wrong with that more comedy more comedy from this from this guy than anything else and that's what makes the movie feel re- too relaxed in, in a way it it does it subtracts the crime and it subtracts the drama and it just emphasizes on comedy with this guy there was too many comedy even when he was getting tortured I was like you laugh like oh wait a second <laughs> yeah. and, and and when he tries to escape that's another comedy I was like wait a second is this actually <laughs> happening no come on <laughs> yeah and um, and you know you mentioned um, their personal relationship as well, and that could be why Cain was as soft as he was on Rob. You know he was um, he was he was about as hard as trying to make Rob afraid. Yeah. But at the same time, he was also you know like like say you go to a fight and you say you're about to fight a close friend. You really don't want to, but if you have to, you will. So you kind of try to be that voice of reason, like, hey, look, why are we doing this? You need to just walk away. Right. And I felt like that's what, you know, that relationship between Kane and Rob is like, dude, you really don't want to do this. You know how cold-blooded I could be, how cold-hearted I can be. You worked with me for so many years. Um, but I see you as a friend, as a family, and I really don't want this to go down between us. But if you don't back off now, you know, you will you will really get yourself in deep water. So it could also be that whole, like, dynamic between them, why Cain was so soft. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, was a, that was an interesting mix right there. And for this type of film, it plays out well. Um, just need a little bit more emphasis on Kane but overall I think the performance is good I think Rob's chemistry with him was was good and even for the torture scene it was so low key as well if they if the production would have went overboard let's say like the movie 3 that we had reviewed here before or something like Saw like the gore factor would be extreme it would change the whole dynamic of this film or let's say if Kane was something like Scarface once again the whole dynamic would change for this film the way it is it works out well Kane even though he's all bark he stands his role Rob compliments that role the yin and the yang 
and it's, it's a good film. It's a good film. A little plot holes, but I think we're going to cover the plot holes in our closing remarks for this podcast on, on The Pinch. <laughs> In our second interview, I present, I gladly present, my conversation with actor Gunnar Wright. This is part two of a two-part interview with Mr. Wright. The first interview is focused entirely on his work on the Dead Space video game franchise, to which he lends his voice as the great protagonist, Isaac Clarke. But in this first installment of the interview, we will be discussing his latest role as Rob in the crime drama thriller, The Pinch. And Rob is Gunnar Wright's lead role in this film. So do check it out if you're a fan of Mr. Wright's work. And in this interview, we covered the various aspects of his role as an actor in general, not only on the pinch, but in general, working in Hollywood, getting into roles of upcoming films, working on films, because in reality, it's something that you love and it's something that you enjoy, but also it also is a job that you have to work hard at in order to pay your rent and put food on the table. You have to balance the best of both worlds, and we cover that topic in our interview. So without further ado, once again, it is a great pleasure to present my interview with actor Gunnar Wright. Once again, Mr. Gunnar Wright, thank you for your time. Happy Friday, and uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, one of the topics we're going to be discussing is, of course, your uh, memorable role in the video game franchise Dead Space. And as a fan of Dead Space, I got to tell you, this is one of the highlights interviews I've had in, in my career of entertainment journalism. Oh, it's wonderful, man. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, but before we begin our interview with uh, Dead Space, uh, your latest role in The Pinch, let's delve on this uh, project for a while. In your latest role, The Pinch, you portray the character Rob. And to me, in my opinion, after watching the film and, of course, reviewing it, he seems to be an individual that is relatable with his flaws. So for you as an actor, what really jumped out for you in your initial read of the script? You know, Ken, that particular project, and, and this is something that's great for the listeners, especially the ones that are that are acting currently, mm -hmm. You know, you, you look at projects based off of, of many factors from creative to financial to sometimes at the end of the day, literally just working. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when I had uh, come across the script with the pinch, it was a slow time in Hollywood uh, around summertime. Um, I was, you know, you're at, in some ways you're, you're an athlete. You need to tune mm -hmm. up and um, you need to continue to work. Um, and, and sometimes it's not the money. Sometimes it's literally just massaging the muscle. And I remember I'm like thinking in my mind, okay, you know, am, am I going to go do a play? I, I, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm hungry to just get in front of the camera or get on stage and, 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 and work and play. And I came across the pinch and, um, I loved the story. I thought it was great. It, I kind of chuckled just thinking about the flaws of, of Rob's character and, and obviously the, the funniness of his boss. Uh, and um, long term short, I talked to the director and I knew it was going to be literally a, a, a labor of love. It was a, I mean, his, his parents and, and um, the, the family were, were cooking lunches and, uh, you know, uh, that uh, everything you can think of from indie right. filmmaking was in that mm -hmm. movie. And, and yet we had such a blast. It was a fun role to play. And, and again, it was an opportunity to spend uh, a couple of weeks massaging muscles and playing and just getting in front of a camera. And, uh, and I really am proud of that little project, especially I'm, I'm proud of Ashley 
uh, who literally did everything. I mean, um, and we didn't have a, 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 a typical cliche, literally no budget, no time. And, um, and, uh, and yet, um, I was watching it, uh, last night again on Amazon prime, just to gear up for a conversation. And I, I was like, you know what, for what we had to work mm-hmm. with <laughs> <laughs> and the craziness that ensued, I'm proud of that little movie. And, and again, it was, it was, I looked at it going into it. Like, look, I'm, this is practice for me. This is a way to just keep right. playing. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you can always look at something in hindsight and go, gosh, I fell flat on this or I just could have been better. But, you know, you got to look at it in the circumstances that, it, it, you know, for, for literally indie filmmaking, this is what that movie represents. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. And I was speaking with, we had also interviewed uh, Ashley and he made some references, of course, on indie filmmaking from the acting, uh, securing the actors, that is, all the way to securing locations. So it, it definitely, as you had stated, does fall into the term of indie filmmaking in which everybody puts their hand in. And, and from your point of view, uh, I, I see it as very important, especially for actors, that you have to pick up projects to, to flex your muscle just like an athlete has to tune up before a fight. Uh, without those, uh, without those roles in, in, in indie filmmaking, especially, uh, when the next role comes in for, let's say, major motion picture, we kind of feel, uh, like, uh, intimidated being in front of the camera. 100%. You know, I mean, uh, if you're, uh, and this is just to speak mm-hmm. frank, if you've got, if you've got, um, A level representation mm-hmm. and you're in this, um, a level uh, um, window of community where you're bombarded with the best, the biggest, I'll just, I shouldn't say the best, but the biggest opportunity, the biggest scripts, the biggest producer sessions, the, the, uh, the, the, the creme de la creme of, of what's happening right now with content. Um, it's not just the confidence that you have, but you're, you're already, you know, always, um, I wouldn't say innocent until proven guilty, but you're, you're, um, you're on a playing field that is very rare, very precious. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, you've got incredible work. You've got, um, uh, we're really in a lot of ways, some of the most avant garde, some of the most hungry artists are, are um, thriving and, and circulating to try to get into this arena that is so precious and so wonderful. Um, uh, and yet you're absolutely right. I mean, when you're, uh, I make a great living as a working actor. I have a, a few projects that I've been blessed to be able to be a part of kind of working in this mm-hmm. arena, you know, working with huge budgets and like the machine of, of uh, storytelling, movie making, video game work, um, and, and yet, um, not that you're on the outside, but um, you know, it's like, look, at the end of the day, I'm going to make a living as an actor, and if that's shooting a commercial or doing an indie film, um, working TV, it's like you're—I wouldn't call it necessarily a blue collar actor, but in a lot of ways, you know, that's what you're doing is you're. You know, uh, one week you might do, okay, I'm going to voice over this uh, commercial spot. Uh, I'm going to do some motion capture for this project. Uh, I'm flying to New York to, uh, to guest star on this uh, network TV show. And so you're doing all these different things in all these different facets of acting. Um, but at the same time, what they end up doing is they, they really do, they well round you, not just with experience, but with kind of different nuances of the mm-hmm. craft. And if you go too long without that, me personally, I'm speaking uh, of myself, I, I feel, you know, from the days of racing motorcycles and, and being a part of uh, a sports and as an athlete, yeah, you, you, you feel like you're losing some kind of a creative mm-hmm. edge. And for me right now in my career, that that means that I, I don't feel like, okay, I want to write something and direct or have my friends uh, work with me and create something. I'm not at that point. It's something that I don't 
wake up and, and want to do. But what I do want to do is be a part of someone's project, someone's creative vision. And if it's, it's something that I'd like to do, then it really isn't about necessarily the money because again, you know, you, you, you do the things you have right. to do to be able to do the things that you want to do and love to do. So, you know, if I, if I, if I've gone too long without being in front of the camera or flexing that creative acting muscle, I'll look for projects just to be a part of and, and to do. And, and something like the pinch was uh, a wonderful, fun uh, opportunity to just play. It's quite fascinating. And it seems to be a, a, a recurring theme topic that is with our interviewees. And it's just the point that you have made as well is uh, doing the craft, doing the daily grind and, and being in the performing arts And also, of course, you have to make a living off of it. And with that, it comes uh, really finding the work out there. Uh, and as you have elaborated, uh, going into different aspects of film and voiceovers to really tune your craft and hone in on your skills. It's a very fine line to tread on when you want to do something to pay the bills and also do something that you have so much passion for. You know, and, and, and the other thing is too, Ken is, I love it. I, I guess that's the, that's the, the common denominator of, of all of it is not really any of it is, is work. right. <laughs> it's, it's all so much fun. And, and more importantly, what I've realized over the last 15 years, uh, 20 years is, is it all feeds itself. You know, I'll give you an example. You and I are doing, uh, let's just say, voiceover work on a video game. Well, I go to New York and I, I uh, guest star on a network TV show. I come back to L.A. and then about two weeks later, I get a call that they need some ADR work done because there was some problem with the boom or there was an issue with the mic. And it's like I'm back in a, uh, a, a I'm, I'm back in a, in a in a vocal booth doing voiceover work to threadline the audio for this network TV show and yet it's not a video game you're not you know it's you're not on camera you're 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 lending your voice but you're trying to match the frame you're trying to match the tone and the energy and the emotion of what was shot you know two and a half three weeks before right. prior and and yet again it's like it all feeds mm -hmm. itself uh, all that work of doing voiceover work for a video game uh, or animation project or commercial Uh, in my mind, it kind of helps keep that muscle flexed for when you have to do something like that ADR for a TV show. Mm -hmm. oh, that's an interesting point of view. Uh, and l looking at your slate of roles on INDB, uh, you portray what seems to be uh, the normal guy. Of course, there are exceptions, but with that regular guy and those aptitudes and conflicts, what are, what are about these characters that really relate to you the most, especially as an actor getting involved on these projects? I've always loved, I wouldn't necessarily call it the underdog uh, or anti-hero, but I've gravitated towards those types of characters as a, even as mm -hmm. a kid, you know, um, the flawed, the flawed, non-perfect superhero. And, and I think that, you know, we can, we can look at a lot of different uh, even superhero roles and the, the wonderful nuances of, of, of those characters are probably their flaws. Mm -hmm. um, but um, those were the types of roles that I always liked and gravitated towards and getting into acting. You know, I wasn't that, I wasn't that actor who had the huge muscles and, and had that presence of, uh, of sheer just size and physique. So, you know, not that, that was what I was fighting towards, but, um, I, I guess it didn't really interest me. You know, I loved, um, you know, some of the aspects of guys like Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. They were some of my heroes growing up because not only did they play these really wonderful characters that, that were flawed, that weren't, you know, they didn't have all their stuff together, but in real life, you know, these guys were badasses, <laughs> man. They raced cars, they raced right. motorcycles. They were, they were, in some ways more of a hero or a, or a manly man, if you could say that off camera than they were when they were in front of the lens. And I just thought that was so fascinating. And, and I really fed off of that as a young actor. Um, 
because of my motorsports and motorcycle racing background, uh, that, uh, there was a, there was a common thread with those two particular actors. And then when I started to audition, those were some of the roles that I would just naturally mm-hmm. get, um, you know, the, uh, ordinary guy thrust into an extreme situation who's not going to cow and not going to, uh, back down. Uh, he's going to fight to survive. And yet he's going to fight based off of sheer will, not necessarily off of, uh, technique and, uh, and experience, right. you know? So with something like Isaac Clark in Dead Space or, um, Kathleen Miller, uh, who happens to be astronaut, but he's, left on uh, the ISS space station and you don't know why and he's trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, I just, those roles I started to book and they're, they're actually just, they're just so much fun. One thing that is quite fascinating, it, across genres, it could be from horror to action to, of course, the, the thriller, action thriller, like the pinch is the character arc and uh, have portraying a character that really resonates with the real life scenarios is, and connects with the audience that is so important as an actor to really work with because you have material you have what his likes his dislikes his flaws his strengths and as you have mentioned he doesn't need big muscles to solve the problems uh, intellect always wins in the end in some shape or form yeah i think that you know look the more that you can be relatable to the audience, you know, even if it's just, oh gosh, I got an uncle like that, or uh, you know, it, it, as much as you as your character can be relatable, the more that the audience can connect with that character, and um, those are things that you don't necessarily realize when you first uh, start getting into the the mindset of an actor and auditioning. I think a lot of those things hit you, not just being okay, what am I booking or, or what are my reps from casting and producers seeing me as? Because again, that can also be uh, a difficult situation where you're like, Hey, I know I'm not, but I know I can do these other things and I need to fight to try to flex those creative muscles. But I do believe that once you start auditioning, you start, you know, looking for material to be a part of, um, your it's it's human nature. You start gravitating towards characters that you connect with, or that you um, you admire, or that you under, you at least try to understand. And I mean, uh, yeah, there's just so many wonderful characters that are are that kind of everyman or anti-hero that I've loved since I was a kid. That I think really stand the test of time because a lot of those character traits never change. You know, um, fighting for your family, fighting for your will to survive, um, fighting for your voice, um, you know, questioning sanity and questioning your humanity. Um, those are questions that <laughs> now just as much as any other time has been important for, uh, for a character to betray, but also for the audience to connect mm. with. Interesting point. And, uh, before we jump into the <clears throat> topic of Dead Space, uh, your recent projects have delved into horror, and this is an arena I see it has more challenges because as an actor and actress, there is not only portraying the character with voice, but there's also the physical attributes that you need to do. Sometimes there's the hand-to-hand or sometimes there's no dialogue but you have to convey to the audience a sense of fear a sense of dread uh <clears throat> is that an area that as an actor you feel challenging you know i think that uh any form of acting can be challenging mm. and i think that that's really where the 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 creative the the scare the insecurity lies. I mean, you talk to some of the greatest actors in our generation and before, mm-hmm. and if you ask them, you know, why did you take this particular project? Mm-hmm. A lot of times you'll hear them say, because I didn't, I didn't know if I could do it, you know, or I was scared to, 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 to possibly fail. And, and, um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think that you can, you can take the horror out of uh, a lot of that question and just broaden it to, you know, um, what, uh, what are difficulties for individual actors and every actor is going to say something mm-hmm. different. 
I actually thrive and I like um, dialogue to me um, obviously is important because you're literally either explaining something to further the story or to get a point across for the audience, right. um, uh, you know, or you're communicating uh, back and forth. How, uh, however, I, I do love less dialogue. Uh, meaning I, I, if, if dialogue is important, then you, you work that in and you make that part of it. If it's not, and you can visually tell what you need to tell for the audience, I would much rather do that. Mm. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, there's, uh, so it's not just horror. It's any project that I can inject that silence into. Okay. Um, I, I connect with, I like that. I like that. Um, I, I, there's a lot of movies where I'll look at those types of performances, very minimal dialogue, just wonderful because everything said without needing to be able to, to, to read it on someone's lips, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, but horror is difficult, uh, in general, just because of what you said, it's, 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 um, there's this other character, there's, there's this other element, um, that is basically fear. It's, uh, it's what's around the corner. It's this visual, um, emotion of tension that, uh, done right, as we all know, it's it's almost like that wonderful roller coaster ride <laughs> that scares the crap out of you, but you want to get back on it and ride it again and again. So uh, horror is a difficult thing. I don't have a lot of experience in that particular mm -hmm. genre, but um, as an actor, it's uh, literally it's it's a scary thing to be a part of when it's done right and uh, and just as thrilling. Right, right. That is that is true, and also I, ha I have to admit that. We also reviewed one uh, a horror film that you were in. I am alone. It was back in 2015. I was like, oh wow, look at that! Uh, interesting concept in that film itself. Yeah, another another opportunity to just go and play. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys. We, we did this movie. Uh, one of them does uh, visual effects here in Hollywood. Uh, the other one's a producer on uh, a lot of reality TV, and that's their day jobs. And they came up with a, a fun, cool idea. It was a Kickstarter campaign back when Kickstarter was, was something that was forged and new. And, and, uh, you know, they got, uh, 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 Gareth, uh, David Lloyd, uh, involved from, uh, uh, the UK. And, uh, I read the script and I chuckled and, and, and yet it was an interesting, uh, concept at that time. And we, they did a lot of work to try to get, uh, to get this project up off the ground. We went to Colorado to shoot and kind of lived, um, <laughs> near the mountains of Montrose. And, uh, again, another project that I had such a great time doing it. It was such a pleasure to work with those guys. And, um, I was just so humbled to see someone, you know, put together a project from writing it to just producing it, getting it, off the ground and then finishing it you know, and, and seeing it through uh, when all I had to do at the end of the day was get myself, or, you know, get to Colorado, uh, work on the project, uh, do some ADR, and then, you know, I'm off to the next. They had to live with that project for another nine months to a year. And that's the other tough thing. And it's not just indie filmmaking. It's studio projects too. You know, people forget I just finished up a, I, uh, I finished a film for 20th Century Fox. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be amazing. It's called Underwater. It's very, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, well, without give, giving it away, it, it has an alien element uh, of Ridley Scott, but instead of being in space, you're uh, um, thousands of feet deep. But, you know, we shot, I shot those scenes two years ago. Really, uh, and and you know that movie's probably supposed to hit sometime this year, and it's got a wonderful cast: Kristen Stewart. Um, it's it's going to be again, it's going to be an amazing, amazing uh, visual uh, picture for anybody who loves sci-fi and kind of in that horror realm. But movies take time, and projects take time, and it's like you know every I can I can, yeah I can think of of something like a Kickstarter campaign, which was I Am Alone or Ashley's uh, The Pinch. You know, I'm just seeing that movie in 2019. Uh, and yet, you know, we shot that movie 
close to two years ago. So, you know, you're looking at one year to two year windows a lot of times between projects. And, um, and that's a lot of time. It's a lot of time for the people that are actually invested producing, writing, shooting, and finishing and post these projects where a lot of actors, including myself, if you're not really invested that way, you're done. Once your project, once your part of the, of the puzzle is finished, you don't see it until you see it, you know, in the theater or on, uh, on TV. So I respect so much the filmmaking process and for anybody who's listening, who has a script or they're in that situation of pre-production or post, you know, my hat's off to them because um, it's so easy to talk about it. It's so difficult to see it through and what an accomplishment, what a checkered flag it is when you, when you finish it and it's living somewhere. And it's such a wonderful time to be filmmakers and to be actors, in my opinion, um, because there's so many different platforms. There's so many ways. Uh, it's like Amazon Prime has the, has the pinch, you know, and uh, Netflix had played um, the, the science fiction film Love. And so there's so many ways, not that it's easy, but there's just so many ways to, to get your projects out there and be seen. And to me, I don't, I don't care how much money you make off of it. It's a win just to see it through. The Pinch. Closing thoughts. In this fourth and final segment covering the film The Pinch, it is the closing thoughts. Closing thoughts here. For budget-wise, I'm not sure how much the budget was for this film, but I can assure you this is an independent film and the budget was very, very low. That said, these locations, the backdrops, the homes, what, what looks to be a precinct, but I'm, I'm assuming it's not really a precinct, and everywhere else, it just adds up well with the film. The downfall Mm, too much comedic elements with the two hitmen Scotty and Darren their jokes were very dry but hey it's it's a, it's an indie film what can you expect I'm not expecting uh, a funny ha 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 laughter here and there it, it works for the context of the film I enjoyed the main character portrayed by Gunnar Wright also I enjoyed the villain portrayed by James Aston Lake very little takeaways here Very, I think for for what it's worth and whatever budget it had it works well this is a good film to to watch I would say yeah this, I would classify this as a spaghetti film get some spaghetti bottle of wine garlic bread watch it have a good dinner over this film yeah that's the type of film this is uh, it's funny you mentioned that because um, my dinner tonight was spaghetti. Uh. <laughs> Minus the wine, but that was dinner today. Uh, spaghetti and garlic bread. But um, I agree the comedy element outweighs the action and crime uh, aspect of it. The whole dynamic between Rob and Kane are is comical very comical um for a crime boss and um henchmen that's the crime boss and henchmen it's uh <laughs> it's funny because as we mentioned before kane uh doesn't really show that really fierce side that a crime boss can be and you've mentioned um You've mentioned Scarface before. Well, I don't see Scarface in Kane at all. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> what about Denzel Washington and American Gangster? I don't see that. Right. In Kane at we, all. We, that's what we needed to see. We needed to see yeah. some wholehearted badassery. We didn't see that from Kane. Yeah. I mean, I think we saw more more badassery from Scotty and Darren than we did <laughs> from Robin Kane. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the Keystone um, Cops, but yeah. in Hitman form. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, wow. Huh. But one thing that really irritated me of the film, one thing were the cops. I say, wait a second. I know they're trying to be crooked cops. I know that, but that was way over the top. That uh, oh. <laughs> uh, it was 
<laughs> it was too exaggerated. Oh. Like, wait a second, really, no. guys? No, that doesn't happen. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, come on, like they were trying to like catch up and everything. It's like they're just like staking out in front of the house in daylight. Exactly. Like, okay, we really <laughs> gotta go. First of all. A stakeout doesn't happen in daylight. That's why it's called a stakeout. You wait till nighttime and you stay hidden where you can't be seen. That's what a stakeout is, you know. Secondly, <laughs> if you're trying to get this guy, you don't send some realtor to the house saying, "Oh yeah, I'm trying to sell the house." Yeah. Uh, like, what? <laughs> what was that? That <laughs> was the yeah. Girl Scout there trying to sell cookies. Like, yeah. Seriously. <laughs> They, they, yeah. Oh man, there was there I was think some. The Girl Scout would have had more of a success getting in. Exactly. <laughs> who can say no to the Girl Scout? <laughs> exactly. Uh, those cops, they they felt so. Mm, I would say generic. I would. They they were too exaggerated. Yes, I understand they're crooked cops, but it just felt way overplayed. Like tone it down a little don't make it so uh, they should they should have just worn a shirt is that said crooked cops is, instead of just acting <laughs> like what i'm like really go or they should have had a tattoo over their forehead of desperation and just a big old word desperation right <laughs> yeah they were like, too desperate too yeah <laughs> they were so desperate that they were coming up with oh well let's just tell him that we'll give him a bonus and a nice little one bedroom apartment <laughs> oh. <laughs> and see if he catches the bait uh, <laughs> like what <laughs> yeah what the hell is going on here oh well <laughs> wow well but that's that also adds to the comedy it just felt it felt yeah. like those cops were comedy relief too just like the hitman Scotty and Darren I think the cops were comedy and that also yeah they were it took it took away from the action too like oh yeah okay when when the scenes would cut away from Rob and Kane and it would go to either the hitman or the cops I'm like oh okay here we go I, I would I would much rather the cops not be involved because in the end of the film it just doesn't add up it's like wait a second what just happened and everybody just casually walking up to the house like oh okay oh all right <laughs> like what the hell's going yeah. on here that's not how it works yeah <laughs> exactly and uh you see um this guy's like that ain't no realtor <laughs> he's the only one who gets it <laughs> but um I, I, thought, I thought it was so funny that Rob actually thought that was a realtor. Yes. Yeah, I yes. mean, it's like you, you see this mysterious car parked out in front of the house, and it's just been, been parked there for the longest. You know, you see people in the car. It's like, in suspicion rays, like, who are they? Right, right. You know, right. that suspicion just never came to Rob. Right. You know, he's just like, oh, it's some realtor trying to sell the house. This guy's like, realtor? <laughs> you have no realtor. <laughs> He's like, oh, Scotty is the only uh, smart one here. I see. <laughs> right. Yes. There and, was some. Um, right. There was some instances there that Rob was. Like, Wait a second. You're supposed to have street smarts, and that's how you're acting. I could. Yeah. I can't yeah. believe he was the henchman, and he couldn't. Like, what? How long have you worked for this guy? How long have you been this guy's henchman? And. You can tell a realtor from a cop, like right. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that like, that was no. yeah, yeah. You're right. That, I think this film was like eighty percent comedy, right? <laughs> and, and it was not supposed to be comedy. It's supposed to be <laughs> a action crime drama. That's the, that's the weird part here. Well, that's why I said like I felt like I was watching a spoof. Because I'm like, this is like 80% comedy. And I mean, I kept, I was getting frustrated with Rob. Like, dude, what are you doing? Come on. You got to, like, you got to put some intimidation in there. You're right. supposed to be the crime boss of Hitchman. Why are you? <laughs> it was just hilarious. I'm like, okay. This <laughs> I can't even. So I just sat back and just watched the feel for what it was. Like, oh, this is a fun time <laughs> right well Ashley Scott Myers this is his first film he has a career already established as a screenwriter 
he also wrote the film, and I don't know if you remember the uh, Snakes Out of Compton a, a couple of years back. Oh, I haven't watched it, but I know what you're talking about. Right, right. And in the interview, uh, Ashley Scott Myers uh, discussed his his established career as a screenwriter and how sometimes as a screenwriter you get hired to write scripts but once that script gets into the producer's hands they'll dissect the shit out of it and what you wrote is not what you see on film even though you have credit for it so he took it upon himself to say you know what I'm gonna write my story I'm gonna direct it myself and that's what he did with the pinch and I have to say for first time director very few of course there's flaws here and there but overall in comparison to other films that we have seen in the indie in the field this is pretty good and enjoyable and at least the acting is not b rated uh wow like b rated terrible at least we don't have that here yeah and actually um this is <clears throat> like this is a different light when you've seen so many um hardcore you know uh gangster and mafia films like-minded films that take a more in-depth turn and they're all about you know bloodshed and right like that so this is a different spin to it uh a whole new life so that's good as well right and hey to create those shootouts and all that blood and gore and all that stuff even at, even for a mafia film that costs money and when you yeah. create your first film i think this is a great approach low-key small cast do it work with what you have and that's how we, we could see that's how this film came about now if the budget would have been bigger i know we would have had car chases and shootouts and decapitation something like sicario you know renting out machine guns and stuntmen but we would have had our scar face. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But overall, it's a good film. It's a good film. 